Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, we are now in the season of Lent, which is the season of preparation for the celebration of the resurrection. And over the next several weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about Jesus and the events of his death and his resurrection as we celebrate his love and his power and his grace. And today we are launching a new series of messages titled Love in Action. And this is something that we've done for the past few years. And we kind of look at how God expresses his love for us and how we can express that love to others through actions. And what we're going to do today and in the next few weeks is take three different images from the life of Jesus and see how we can walk out those principles in our lives. And I believe that these principles, well, they really quite honestly have the potential to do a great work in each of our hearts. And so I just want to jump in with some good but difficult stuff as we look at the fact that Jesus forgives sinners. And that we are not only sinners who receive forgiveness, but we are sinners who are called by Jesus to love like him and to forgive other sinners as well. So let's look at one of the most amazing displays of forgiveness that you could ever imagine as Jesus is hanging on the cross. And we're going to look at this in Luke 23, but I just want to give you some context <clears throat> for you to keep in mind. So Jesus was completely innocent. He'd never sinned. He, he's hanging here on the cross between two criminals. Luke tells us that uh, in chapter 23. He says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and the other on his left. Now, as we read about this, a lot of times I think we don't really understand the reality of what's going on on the cross. For one thing, whenever we uh, watch a scene from a television or from a movie, we typically see Jesus and the other criminals hanging quite high in the air. But in reality, scholars tell us that the cross beam of a cross was actually attached at around six to nine feet off the ground. So that would likely put a person's feet closer to like three feet or less off the ground. And, and a person being crucified, they must have felt like, oh, you know, the, like the ground is just right there. Uh, they could just be on it in a step, but they couldn't. So this is really a much more intimate picture than we often see portrayed in art and in media. And scholars further tell us that uh, the cross was designed to torture and to bring extreme humiliation. It was very expensive to do a crucifixion, and so therefore it was reserved for the worst of the worst. And it was like an intentional statement of torture. In fact, the word excruciating, uh, as in excruciating pain, that word actually comes out of the cross. It is to torture, torment, inflict very severe pain on as if by crucifying, excruciating. And they would drive nails through the flesh of an individual's hands or wrists and the heel bone of their foot and attach them to the cross. And, and, and people would come by and they would mock them. They weren't looking up at the sky uh, at them. They were almost eye to eye with them. And, uh, and they were just like mocking and spitting on people when they were crucified. And this is what's happening to Jesus. They're spitting on him. They're mocking him. One of the other criminals said, you saved yourself. Or you saved others. Why, why don't you save yourself? Hail, hail, king of the Jews. And they're just spitting on him and mocking him. And at that moment... When God's creation was at its worst, mocking the creator in the flesh, right there in that moment, Jesus prayed the most amazing prayer. As they are there in his face, doing their worst to the one who is giving his life for their sins, Jesus says this in verse 34. He says, Father, Forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. 
Jesus is asking for forgiveness for those who are sinning against him. This is like a moment of forgiving something that seemed totally and completely unforgivable. And you and I need to tap into his power and his peace so that we can do as he did. Because we are not only sinners who receive forgiveness, but we are sinners who are called by Jesus to love like him and to forgive other sinners as well. Oof, it's getting a little heavy this morning, isn't it? Well, here's the truth of life. If you live long enough, you're going to be hurt by somebody. In fact, many of us right now, you're carrying a significant wound. Someone abused you. Someone took advantage of you. Someone lied to you, cheated you. Someone hurt someone that you love. Someone took advantage of someone that you love. Someone who's a, a Christian, they didn't act very Christ-like to you. Some church that you were a part of did something that just devastated you, whether they knew it or not. Someone gossiped about you and said something that wasn't true. Some boss didn't appreciate you, and you ended up losing your job, and you feel like it was totally and completely unjustified and unfair. And most likely there are some of us, and you were hurt by someone who is no longer alive, and yet you are still carrying the weight and the bitterness. Maybe it was a mom or a dad or other family member, and they weren't there for you. They abandoned you, or maybe they were inappropriate with you. And for, for some of us, well, maybe it's not something really, really big. It's just that ongoing person that every time you're around them, it's just like fingernails down a chalkboard, and they just say things that make you feel like whatever you do isn't good enough, and so you, you just struggle to be around them. For some of us, uh, something happened in your life, and you're angry at God. God, why would you let this happen? For some of us, you're angry at yourself. You did something and you can't believe you did it and you can't undo what you did and you're carrying this unforgiveness towards yourself. And you may need and even know that God has forgiven you, but still you're unwilling or unable to forgive yourself at this point. So that raises uh, the big question as we consider how we can put love into action. And that question is this. How do we forgive like Jesus? Because this is at the heart of the gospel. Jesus came to forgive sinners. And as we are forgiven, he calls us to forgive one another. In fact, Jesus said, this is how those who are skeptical will actually know that we are followers of Jesus, by the way that we love one another. But how can we truly be people of love without forgiveness? So I want to give you two simple thoughts here on how we learn to forgive like Jesus. And the first thought is this, that Jesus actually teaches us to pray for those who hurt us. Pray for those who hurt you. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross, and that's what he taught us to do. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 28, Jesus said this, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Oof. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those you, who hurt you. And some of us are like, oh yeah, I'll pray for him, all right. There's a, a song lyric I know, and it says this, uh, I pray your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray that a flower pot falls from a window sill and knocks you on the head, just like I'd like to do. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know, wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. And maybe that's what you're thinking, right? Like, yeah, I'm going to pray for you, all right. 
Well, that's not at all what Jesus is suggesting, of course. He means like, for real, pray for those who hurt you. And what Jesus said, well, it was shocking. Pray for those who hurt you. And Jesus also says this in Matthew 5, and truly, when he said this, this was jaw-dropping to his audience. They had never heard anything like he was about to say because they had always been taught for their entire lives, they had been taught the exact opposite of what he was saying. And let me just pause to plead with you for a minute. If you've been a Christian for a while, let me just ask you, please don't let the familiarity of this verse rob you of the significant impact it could have if you were hearing it for the first time. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 43. He said, you have heard it said. In other words, you've been taught this your entire life. Everybody has said this. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You've been taught your entire life. Love those who love you and hate those who are unkind to you. But I tell you, he says, and this was shocking, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the moment that Jesus would have said this, you would have been able to hear a pin drop. Like, what? Did he just say what I thought he said? No way. It was shocking. And why was it so shocking? Well, because the Romans worshipped the God of revenge. And so the Roman audience was bent in the direction of revenge. And the Jewish audience had always been taught an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood. When someone else wrongs you, you wrong them back. When someone takes something from you, you take something back. When they break a bone of yours, you break a bone of theirs. And Jesus is saying, don't seek revenge. You pray for those who persecute you. You love your enemies. Now, if you've been a Christian for a long time and you've been around the church for a while, you've heard all about uh, love your enemies, right? It's not shocking to us, and so it's kind of easier for us to absorb, right? Uh, it doesn't really seem all that difficult until you have an enemy, right? And I'm talking about like somebody who hurts your kid or lies about your spouse or lies about you. And you're like, I love my enemies until I have an enemy. And then all of a sudden, I don't want to love my enemy. And here's what we need to see. If you've been devastated by someone, let down by someone, someone lied about you, someone gossiped about you, that the first place that we need to start is that we are to pray for them like really for real pray for those who hurt you and we don't pray that something bad would happen to them we actually start to for real pray for them and that looks uh, all sorts of different ways but what we see here the one thing that Jesus is teaching us here is that a right attitude precedes a right action right attitude precedes a right action. You see, when I'm overwhelmed with bitterness in my heart towards someone, there is no way that I'm going to have a right action because I don't have a right attitude. But if I'm praying for someone, well, what happens? My attitude starts to slowly change, a, a little change and a little change and a little change. It won't happen all at once. But a right attitude will eventually lead to right actions. And if you're just sitting there waiting for a feeling to forgive somebody who did something significantly wrong to you or to someone you love, well, you may be waiting until Jesus returns to have that feeling, and it probably still won't even come then, right? If you're just waiting to be in the mood to forgive, you will likely never be in the mood. 
And so you start by having a right attitude and then eventually right attitudes will lead to right actions. And make no mistake, when we do this, we need to do this with the help of God, yes? And I can tell you from personal experience how I've done this because really we don't know how to pray for someone who's hurt you, right? Uh, and that's understandable. And uh, so just start by praying something. So lots of times I just start by uh, praying, God, do something in this person's life. Not like do something in this person's life, but do something in this person's life, right? And maybe that's how I start. And, and I just pray that until uh, God gives me something else. He helps me move on in prayer. Maybe to something like <clears throat> God do something significant in this person's life. And then uh, as you do that over and over again, God helps you uh, to pray more. And excuse me, maybe he begins to impress upon you to pray blessing on that person. And then maybe after a while you pray, God, do something significant in this person's life and bring blessing. And let me tell you this. <clears throat> when you start to pray for someone you hate, when you start praying for your enemies, when you start praying for those who persecute you, listen to me. Your prayer may or may not change them, but it will always change you. Let me say it again. Your, prayer, your prayers for others may, may or may not change them, but they will always change you. God, do something significant in this person's life. I pray your greatest blessing upon them. Jesus taught us to do this. How do we put love in action? You don't just love those who love you and hate those who hate you, but you actually pray for those who hurt you and you love your enemies. And so number one, we pray for those who hurt us. And number two, we learn this principle. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. And this is what's so important, right? We forgive in the same manner that God has forgiven us. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, Paul said this, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And I don't know about you, but God has forgiven me of a lot. And I can't speak for any of you. I don't know what you've done, how many times you've lied, uh, how many times, uh, how many people you've hurt, how many, uh, how often you've lied to yourself, how often you've disobeyed and sinned against God. I can't speak for you, but I can tell you that I have been forgiven of a lot, and I am to forgive others in the same manner that God has forgiven me. If he's forgiven me of a lot, I am to forgive a lot as well. Now remember, many of us are walking around carrying some intense pain over certain things and certain people. Humble, unfair, unforgivable things that have been done to us or to the people that we love. And Jesus calls us to forgive. So how do we forgive the unforgivable? How do we do it? Well, we forgive as we have been forgiven. Right? At some point, you need to make a choice, and it will be a choice. I want to forgive. And you might say, well, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm going to choose to do what God's word, word says, and I'm going to work towards uh, whatever it takes to forgive. I don't know what that looks like for you. Or you can choose not to forgive. That is also a choice. I won't forgive. I'm, I'm going to be bitter. Maybe that's going to be your choice. Well, let's just walk down that road for a minute. Just choose to be bitter all you want. I'm bitter. Anytime I see that person who hurt me, I'm going to give them an evil look. 
or the obvious silent treatment, right? Anytime I think about that person, oh, I just get angry over and over and over again. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just still so angry and I can't sleep. And that person might not even know I'm mad, but I don't care. I'm going to be bitter. In fact, I'm just going to be the best bitter person around. I'm going to be filled with hateful thoughts. I'm just not going to forgive. Or maybe you keep your bitterness stuffed down inside for the most part. But that there are times and seasons that trigger you and you get stressed and fearful and angry and that causes you to lose sleep and that impacts your relationships with others and these seasons of bitterness and anger, they just fester inside of you. But still, you just won't forgive because they don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, I've heard it said that bitterness is like drinking poison and then hoping the other person dies, right? So is that your game plan? I just hope they die? Hmm. Well, what do you, what do you do? What do you do when you've been hurt? Because it's not so much about what happens to you in life that has an impact. It is about what you do with what happens to you that makes a difference. And the truth is, life hurts and love is hard and people are difficult but you have the power to choose how you will respond to the things that life brings you you can choose to be bitter or you can choose to forgive as you have been forgiven you can choose to start praying, praying for the person who hurt you, praying, uh, praying for God to take the pain away from you, being honest with God. God, I'm angry, and I don't want to forgive. I want to retaliate, and I need you to help me, and I need you to take this pain from me. God, give me the courage uh, to pray for this person. Help me to just give it to you. Take it, Jesus. Take, take the pain. Give me your peace. Help me not to hold on to bitterness, but just to forgive as you have forgiven me. God, you just take it. Take it, God. Just take it. Please, God, just take it. And then one day you play the frozen CD and you just let it go, right? You just do. You just make a choice. And you say, you know what? By faith, I am choosing. And I might not feel like it yet, but I'm going to start praying. And I'm, I'm going to start letting this go. I'm going to say, I start saying it even now. I let this go. I'm going to let go of what they said. I'm going to let go of what they did. I'm going to let go of the hurt. I'm going to let go of the bitterness. I'm just going to let go with God's help. I'm just going to let go. In the same way that God lets my sins go. In the same way that Jesus shed his blood to forgive my sins, that I could be forgiven. I am choosing by faith to let it go. I am choosing by faith to forgive. See, we serve an amazing God, and he can do things that we never even thought were possible when we choose to walk in faith and in forgiveness, even when it's hard, even when, it's, when it hurts. When we do that, we find that God sets us free from those unforgivable things that happen to us in a way that only he can set us free. He can bring beauty out of ashes. He turns graves into gardens because he is just that good. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you're carrying something today, some hurt, some offense, something unforgivable. It could be something significant like that. Or it could just be that annoying person that get, gets on your nerves all the time and you're like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna, not going to let that get to me anymore. I'm just going to reframe how I think and feel and treat people with God's help. Because if we're going to be followers of Jesus, he calls us to a higher standard. 
The world is going to teach you to love those who love you and hate those who hate you. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. We're actually going to do things differently. We pray for those who persecute us. We love our enemies. We forgive as we have been forgiven because that's how Jesus' followers do it. That's how good our God is, that he forgives us freely. And in the same way, we forgive as we have been forgiven. So I want to challenge you today to spend some time thinking about what you have been carrying around with you. Are there things and people that you need to forgive? Uh, Maybe it's a big thing, or maybe really it's just kind of a little thing, but still you haven't forgiven. Today, you can make a decision to forgive, a commitment to forgive, a wanting and willingness to work toward forgiveness. And let me say this too, forgiveness doesn't have to be about going to a person and telling them that you forgive them. And I think sometimes that's why uh, we don't do it, right? We uh, we don't work towards forgiveness because we think that it needs to involve uh, uncomfortable conversations with people. But the reality is, it's more about God working it out in you and you learning how to forgive with his help. And God may lead you to speak to the person who hurt you, but more often than not, he doesn't lead you to those conversations. So we need to worry less about what we may or may have to do uh, or to say to a person, and we need to spend more time and energy just praying for that person and just walking in obedience to do what God calls us to do. And so church today, you have the opportunity to make the choice to forgive because God forgave you and he is just that good. Pray for those who hurt you. Forgive as you have been forgiven and live in the freedom of his love and his grace and his truth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this day, for the opportunities that you've given us in today. God, I don't know um, what this message brings uh, to, to each and every one of us who are hearing it this morning. God, only you know that. You know uh, the things that each of us carry. You know the areas that maybe we're carrying unforgiveness and we become even so hard uh, toward it that we maybe don't even recognize it. God, I pray that you would reveal those areas to each and every one of us where there may be some unforgiveness. Maybe it's a big thing. Maybe it's a little thing. Maybe we have never been in the habit of forgiving, and so maybe there's a, a lot of things that we really just need to let go of and give to you. God, whatever it is, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would give us the courage to listen and to obey. God, every single one of us has been hurt in some significant way by someone and maybe many times by many different people. But we don't want to be bitter people. We want to be Jesus people. So I pray that you help us uh, to pray for those um, who hurt us. That you help us to pray for our enemies, for those who would do harm to us, God, that, that we would pray for them. Help us, too, to forgive them as you have forgiven us. Because when we look through the lenses of your blood and your sacrifice on the cross for our stuff, we have to admit that we've been forgiven of so very much. Help us to forgive others as well. Help us, too, to to find all that we ever need in you. Help us to find our validation. Help us to find our worth. Help us to find our healing and our peace in you and you alone. God, I pray that you would just move in a mighty way in our lives, in our homes, in our community, Lord, that you might be glorified in all that we say, and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you today through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's information, maybe it's an area of forgiveness uh, that he's been speaking to you. Whatever it is, we'd invite you to connect with us if we can be of any assistance to you in any way as you take that next step.
We'd be honored to walk with you, to pray with you, to do life with you, that together we might grow closer and closer to Jesus.